Hello and welcome to this general video on high pressure liquid chromatography or as it has become known now high performance chromatography. This video will focus on reverse phase chromatography in particular. Chromatography is the separation of soluble substances by mass and energy. Liquid chromatography uses a different take on the ideas behind spectroscopy to achieve the same results. It uses the physical and chemical properties of the machines, reagents, and samples. The simplest version involves dissolving the sample in a solution of known properties, beginning the machine and pumping the solvent of known composition into the machine. This stabilizes the column and other parts. At the same time, the column and other components are heated or cooled as required. Then the machine begins to take a sample. This can be as little as 10 microliters. This passes into the line of solvent and into the column. Here, it is separated by chemical reactivity between the column, solvent, and sample. This reactivity either retards or speeds up the progress of the sample. Eventually, it comes out of the machine as a specified product, waste, or mixed sample in order of its reactivity. This is plotted in almost real time as a measure of the excitation and emission energy as measured. This is then compared to a control sample or a straight line. These machines are used to measure blood samples, identify chemical samples, and to purify products in the lab. From here, it will be a general step-by-step -step explanation of the process with a few examples along the way. Samples will be in one of several possible states. Liquids are added to a liquid at known measure, such as pre-made products for a control. This can then be extrapolated to other volumes and concentrations or made in a range of concentrations to create a straight line. For unknown products, this will be either a liquid or a solid. For example, unknown drugs are often dry. By dissolving a known weight or a known volume, it can be calculated how much of the drug is in each weight or volume, such as the purity of cocaine. These are added to the solvent. This solvent is also often the mobile phase. The mobile phase is basically a polar liquid that will interact with the column in the HPLC and test the sample. This creates a reactive environment that can be modified extensively. These are then either divided into a series of 1 to 4 mil sample vials or other storage containers for keeping. The standard practice for most samples is to dissolve it in the mobile phase, but it might be an intermediary solvent or similar to better separate the sample in the HPLC. The sample polarity can be simply thought of as having a magnetic force, and that the more of the force there is, the more it will be grabbed by parts of the machine along the way, which will speed it up, and in contrast, those that have very little magnetic force will be sped up. Beginning the machine and pumping the solvent of known composition is the next step. Methanol and ethanol are common examples of the mobile phase. There is a spectrum of these solvents or mixtures of the solvents. This creates a customizable environment for separating, can be used for many different things. These work by creating a small change in the way each sample interacts at a molecular and structural level. Mostly, it is a change in the electron charge or the availability of free electrons. Adding a highly polar mobile phase with a polar sample leads to a much greater degree of interaction between the mobile phase and the sample than between the column and sample. When the column is also polar, it will increase this reactivity between all of them and create a mess. But if it were non-polar, then the sample would be more reactive with this mobile phase and move through very quickly. This also has another effect. The mobile phase will interact with the column. This is the other highly customizable aspect of the HPLC protocol, as there are a wide range of lengths, diameters, constituents, and styles of column that can be used in combination with the wide variety of mobile phases. The columns are made with the above-mentioned features in mind, but the manufacturers really only focus on the length, diameter, and the composition to decide on style and function. This allows them to manufacture a relatively wide range of products, and some that are even special purpose. As an example, there is the rather non-polar silicon columns, which have little effect on polar substances. These can then have carbon chains added to them, and these carbon chains create a reactive environment that is polar. As a result of this, Polar samples will not move quickly as they are attracted to the column. A non-polar column, on the other hand, would cause them to be repelled in a manner of speaking, 
and pushed out quicker as they travel on the mobile phase. As a general rule, the diameter will generally define usage. Large bore and short length is for rough separation or work with a bulk quantity of mostly pure samples. The long thin columns are for small quantities that need a lot of separation. This can be useful for working with products like sugars. These foul a column very quickly, and this necessitates the cleaning of the column, and this is a time-consuming process. The length of each column indicates how long the column has to interact with the sample. Rather obviously, the longer the column, the more time it has to separate out substances within it, and to either speed up or retard the progress. There is another reason why beginning the pump early is important. It stabilizes the column and other parts of the machine. The columns are often made with a silicon base, and then a series of polar or non-polar chains on top of this again. These are more accurately called the stationary phase. These chains are rather like hands, which will grab onto the polar positions on the samples that pass through the column. These are reactive with the mobile phase and the sample. The mobile phase gets in the way of these hands and prevents them from grasping the sample. By running the mobile phase through the machine first and giving it time to adjust these chains, the mobile phase has an option to interact with them and it allows the sample to later supplant these in the mobile phase or to more accurately compete with the mobile phase. Stabilizing also helps to hydrate the column if they have been standing for a long time and an alcohol-based mobile phase has been used. It also flushes any residual products from the column and machine tubing. The machine can also use this time to create the baseline for the solvent front, a phenomenon where the detector encounters the mobile phase and reads an abnormally large amount of feedback. These graphs are from Dutton and Company, 1999, Wood and Hall, 2000, and Berquist et al., 2001. Whilst the column becomes hydrated and stabilizes, the column and other components are heated or cooled as required. Many modern HPL machines have a refrigerated sample tray, and this is useful for protecting and preserving protein, nucleic, temperature-sensitive samples like food. The machine runs for a time to bring these bays down to temperature. The column is also warmed, some columns are heated, others are cooled, and some operate at room temperature, depending on the needs of the experiment. This can take between 20 and 30 minutes. This also has an effect on how well the polarities of the mobile phase column and sample work. Now that the machine is stabilized, everything is at temperature, the machine will begin to take a sample. This can be as little as 10 microliters. Those samples prepared earlier are now accessed. A tiny needle pierces the HPLC vial and draws out a fractional amount of the sample. This is called the injection volume. One vial can facilitate an easy 100 runs if 10 microliter injections are used, but the amount can vary and this depends on a large number of factors. These include the injection size, how well it is detected, concentration, number of repetitions, and of course the purity. The first run is a blind run with no sample or other factors except the mobile phase. This acts as a blank or background measure. It also allows the researcher or technician to check for errors and problems. This is combined with a mobile phase in the pump unit. This passes onto the column unit. These steps are followed for a vial with a mobile phase and solvent, and then the sample vial or vials. Each is run several times over to account for minor variations and errors until a satisfactory result is achieved. 10 microliters may not sound like much, but the column may only have a few millimeters to hundreds of micrometers of internal diameter. This is also why the machines were called high pressure units. This is due to the comparably high volume to low space measurements. This 10 microliters plus the volume of the mobile phase is a lot for such a small column and machinery with such fine tubing. The sample is passed into the line with the solvent and now goes into the column. The machine will have been calibrated to pump a certain measurement of the mobile phase per a minute. This can be 30 milliliters to as little as 5 milliliters a minute. It varies with column length, diameter, sample, mobile phase, and more. This creates a flow rate and the sample enters into the column with the constant supply of mobile phase. The mobile phase continues to pass over the column surface as it has already been exposed to the polar solution. The constant supply of mobile phase 
pushes everything in the line further into the machine and attempts to force the sample out of the column. The column is where it is separated by chemical reactivity between the column, solvent and sample. The sample is new and it enters with the mobile phase that creates a sort of pulling action. The mobile phase wants to hold onto the sample and drag it with it. This will take it away from the column. You can see from these earlier examples where the serum from animals was separated into different signal molecules. On the other hand, the column is trying to pull on the sample's polar and nonpolar parts differently depending on the column. An example of this is glucose. Glucose is mildly polar, and so a polar column and nonpolar solvent will lead to it being held onto by more of the column surface. This would slow it down. Depending on how much it is slowed down by will dictate how well it is separated from other parts of the sample. Trying to separate an energy drink would be difficult due to the complex nature and multiple types of sugars used, many of these with the glucose unit in it. This leads to a need for a means to figure out what is the thing coming off of the column in a complex sample. Eventually a sample comes out of the machine as a specified product, waste or mixed sample. This has a particular time and comes off in a consistent order. This is the next step after the column. The machine should have broadly or if designed properly separated everything into reasonably discrete units. Some runs are meant to create relatively pure product chunks, and this is known as quantitative HPLC, and the specific analysis of concentration is known as analytical HPLC, generally. More importantly, it creates a time separation. This leads to the next step, the neatly separated sample. The results at this stage, as they have come off the machine, are plotted in almost real time as a measure of the excitation and emission energies, or as measured by other means. This could be electron charge, fluorescence, refraction, conductivity, radiation, and more. In the case of fluorescence, this is like light spectroscopy. The amount of energy going in is predetermined, and the amount coming out indicates the degree of reaction and the relationship can also be used against a standard to establish concentration. This is plotted along a Y scale of strength and an X scale of time. Depending on how the machine has been programmed, this can be either everything above the solvent line or as peaks on the solvent line. As said, this can then be compared to known controls. This could be example a control sample or a straight line graph. In the case of complex samples, this may be easier or harder. Take an example of food. If you only want to measure one specific thing like caffeine, then the sample can be processed and tested to amplify the caffeine response. This is then run multiple times. It creates a measure of the sample. Compare that with a known straight line of caffeine samples and the amount in the food should sit somewhere along it. It could also be quality control, in which it is used to measure one data point against another. This is a binary solution of yes or no. For example, drug manufacturing may use it to establish the concentration of the active ingredient. Too little and it is rejected. Too much and it is rejected. Which means it needs to be just right. Other factors that may affect the HPLC are the temperature of the column, the samples, the concentration of samples, suitability for HPLC, and more again. In the near future, there will be more videos on the different uses and why of columns, solvents, and mobile phases the effect of polarity, and the differences between analytical and quantitative HPLC. Thank you for watching this brief and simple overview of the HPLC process and mechanisms. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you may have below.